others play at simple game, being simple souls. I am of the latter kind, and all I want to do is to find a plot of land and live. boasted the tail end of what had been a really extraordinary company that included people like Geraint Evans, Michael Langdon, Joan Sutherland, John Vickers, the, the list goes on and on. The wonderful people that had gone there. Of course, uh, the UK at that time had a commonwealth. We may well get one back as well. <laughs> uh, we'll wait and see what happens. Um, but as a result of that commonwealth, we had wonderful Australian singers, New Zealand singers, Canadians, and everything else. It was a, a hodgepodge of the whole bit of pink mappery that we made across the world over many years. And the singers came, and it was a rich, rich environment. And I watched it and looked at it and learned from it. Uh, really terrific. You know, they say that these 
days are, these modern days, a new generation always says that, well, you know, we've discovered acting. <laughs> Opera singers now have to act. Well, let me tell you, I was looking at people who could act somewhat and make opera work all those years ago, 50 years ago, 45 years ago. There was great integrity and great value of work and great quality of work being done then. Though we tend to forget that now. We tend to assume that it came up about as a, a result of a new generation and everything else. But there, there was some terrific work being done then. Things to remember about that time. The highlight, I suppose, in my life early on was to be able to sing Papageno with some success, uh, which is not a, you know, it's not a, not a role that you uh, conquer the world with, but it was fun. It was fun, and I moved ahead. But there, there, there were the occasions when you suddenly found yourself on stage with those names where you only simply you, you simply mention either the first name or the second. You know, when people become as celebrated as that, it's either Luciano or Mirella or Jose <laughs> or Nikolai, and you think, oh yes, yes, I, I, I remember those guys and those girls. There were there was something, and for me, I, there were there were two important turning points. Uh, we had a production, and not a very uh, uh, successful production necessarily. Uh, it was a standard, uh, pretty, pretty production of Faust, the great old war horse that is Faust at Covent Garden. And I found myself on stage uh, with uh, a, 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 an Italian soprano called Mirella Freni, um, a tenor called Alfredo Kraus, and a bass called um, Nicolai Giauro. These were <laughs> three of the tidiest singers of the time. Quite a daunting experience. Giaurov, let me tell you about Giaurov. Giaurov was a man so tall. He was a Bulgarian, a bass, basso cantante, he would say. And he always had a timidity about him, despite the fact that he was a very powerful man. But there was something about him, a fragility, a timidity, whatever. And he would go to friends and colleagues and say, can you hear me all right? <laughs> Is my voice cavity? If I listen now, he's been dead 20 years. I can still hear his voice. <laughs> and when I was on stage with this man, I would stand behind him several yards, several meters. And even there, the voice was loud whilst he sang out front. This was extraordinary. Marilla, who's uh, wife she was of, of Nikolai Gerov. used to talk about Marilla. She said, you know, he's, he's no different from anyone else. He just has this head. But he did indeed have a head. And it went straight <laughs> down into his body, <laughs> and throat that wide, and, and there it sat. And this man just would open his glorious, glorious mouth to make this glorious, glorious sound and envelop you in it. It was moments like that are really extraordinary. I don't know how many of you have experienced being alongside a singer of that quality, mm. but it really is extraordinary. Krauss, on that same evening, evening, didn't overpower you with noise. He overpowered you, not with a beautiful voice either. It was a pinched sort of tone, but every tenor in the world respected him. He was the absolute master, a monster of his, of his trade and he could sing the quietest notes at the top of the voice and make the most wonderful diminuendi. He could sing long phrases with great, great style. He was thin, elegant, wonderful, a most wonderful singer who was still singing the young Werther uh, around the age of 70 and still convincing, I can't do that. I'll never be a young Werther, nor, nor slim. Uh, that was never going to be the case. There was too much rugby in my life to say, to say nothing of food. Um, and the other one, of course, was Mirella Freni, with whom I worked a lot. And she is and remains the dearest person you could possibly imagine. Uh, grew up with the same wet nurse, you probably know this, as Luciano Pavarotti. He got the bigger helping. <laughs> from the wet nurse, that is. <laughs> Which goes to explain an awful lot about the man. We, we sang Faust, we recorded Faust together, we recorded on Jägen together, and it was just a, a joy to be with a woman of, of, of that standing and, and 
you have a, an opportunity on a night like that. I was a young fellow, fresh to Covent Garden, relatively fresh still, and standing there on the stage with three giants of opera. And you stand waiting to go on thinking, I'm either going to die tonight and disappear and become a school teacher in the Hebrides, <laughs> or somewhere near Ferde, <laughs> or, I'll, um, or I'll survive. What are you going to do? So you become courageous, and you take a step forward, and you keep going forward. And it lifts you, it takes you up the ladder a little way, and, and, and so on and so forth. And so it builds, and that's where reputations are made in that kind of way. And being in a cauldron, being in a crucible like that, is the most extraordinary experience. I mentioned another man just now who suckled at the same breast as did Mirella, but was rather more thirsty. Uh, and, and that, is, that is Luciano Pavarotti. A lot is said about this man. We, had, we shared the same agent in London for quite some years before he became too big and too hot to handle uh, and became a giant global product. And uh, we, we were scheduled to sing together a performance, a series of performances at La Boheme in London. And uh, th there are so many excuses that uh, singers in particular will make about why they can't get there on the first day of rehearsal, or for the first week of rehearsals, or even two weeks of rehearsals. And I've known three and three and a half and almost four weeks of rehearsals, and still the excuse has come. Never mind, that's another story. Luciano on this occasion couldn't travel to London because he'd had a um, a near miss at Hong Kong. If you've flown into Hong Kong, you'll know that you fly over water. Well, I think this scared him slightly, the fact that the aeroplane was over water. We didn't like to tell him that most aeroplanes are over water <laughs> quite a lot of the time, but this one prevented him from joining us for rehearsals. And so, uh, allowing for the fact that he was arriving late, we did all the business for him. We, uh, you, you know Bohem, the, the, the boys are starving, they've got no fire, they've got no wine or anything, so they, they're tearing up scripts and putting it on a, a furnace and trying, trying to get the place warm. So we did all the business, we made sandwiches, we, we chopped the wood, we made fires, did all of that, poured the wine, knowing that this big man was coming and he would want to save his breath and his energies and everything else in order to sing the great aria and make the great evening, which it would, would undoubtedly be. But we lost patience with him. We were really rather intolerant of the fact that he could get away with three weeks whilst we had to do the lot. Uh, and the day came when he actually did arrive for rehearsal, the day before the dress rehearsal. Uh, that's not uncommon. And in fact, in some theatres, theatres is actually scheduled. Vienna to name but one. Um, more and on. Uh, so he arrived, and we were a little grumpy with him. We didn't communicate greatly. We stopped the fireplace when we could, because we realized he'd already stopped it himself, and he was making sandwiches, and he was pouring wine, and we were thinking, this, this guy's doing everything, we don't need to do it. He even brought his own costume, which was a sort of grey suit with a long scarf. He looked like Doctor Who. <laughs> and he wore his own shoes, which I think, if I remember rightly, were hush, they were available at the time, called hush puppies. Do you remember hush puppies? Pavarotti used to wear hush puppies on stage. They were light. He could get, get around the stage quite nicely. So that, that was it. And he came and he did everything. He did all the business. He'd made the sandwiches and served the sandwiches. He cut the fish up and did all of that stuff. And then we thought, well, let's, you know, we'll find something else to be annoyed about. The fact that he's taken our business away. Uh, and then came the moment for this aria that's called Che Geli da Manina. And we, uh, we stood in the wings, and this man began to sing this aria to Mimi. And, uh, well, to cut a long story short, we forgave him everything. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first time I'd heard him live, the first time I'd been close to him, and he sang this aria including the very big high C. Now, we talked about UC Purling earlier here today, and I'm, he's a god as far as I'm concerned, and he was Pavarotti's god too. But Pavarotti singing this aria won 
us all over. And then the beauty of the role of Marcello, which is mine, in the second act, is that you have little to do. It's a short act, but you sit quite, for quite a long period of time just at the table whilst Musetta sings her song and irritates you really badly. And, and Rodolfo is there at the other, just next to you at the other part of the table singing what he has to sing. And I, I had the privilege, night after night after night, of sitting in my chair, sitting in my chair and just not having anything to do, just watching this man, watching this man's head and his body <coughs> and his mouth and then the sound that came out, which was astonishing. I've never heard anything like it. I've heard Giaurov. I've heard John Vickers almost blow the top off the Albert Hall. But there was something about Pavarotti's singing that was different. It was, it was as though, and it, uh, many people have said this, it was as though the man was a, a, a singing machine. It, he had it all. He had expensive teeth. Um, but the way, the way that he sat in the chair, the position he took in the chair, the, f the, the position of the head, the position of the jaw, everything was absolutely perfect. And it was the most relaxed singing, like Bierling's, that I've, I've ever encountered. And to just watch and think, how the hell do you do that? Yeah. How do you do that? With that sound coming over. People used to say that he had this smaller sound. <laughs> they lie, they lie, I tell you, they lie. There was nothing small about the man's voice at all. He, the, the, the disadvantage that he had was that he wasn't greatly musical. Uh, he needed a lot of work in some of the simplest things. Uh, not the simplest things, but he did need a lot of work and patience, as do many singers, probably myself included, but there we are. Uh, <laughs> but what you get out of it at the end makes it all so worthwhile. He didn't read music, nor did Mirella. Mirella, uh, something, uh, they must have been suckling too much, I think, and they never got time for <laughs> music lessons, the two of them, and, uh, and so they never learned to read music. It all had to be played for them and learned in a very long process. And so it was. But there were many, many great singers. I think, I think, I'm sure every generation says this, but I think I heard the greatest of them. There were some really amazing performances. Vickers, this man I talk about, the Canadian tenor, was a dramatic tenor, uh, growing up in Canada, um, and then eventually owning most of it. Uh, <laughs> so successful was he. And uh, a, a small man, a relatively small man, largely because he had very bowed legs, uh, and he had them straightened late in life and became much taller. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I saw him, I saw him <laughs> well into his retirement and he had an operation on his legs. And suddenly I was sort of face to face with this uh, very, very strange experience. <laughs> but we recorded many things and we, we were on stage together with many things. And uh, he was um, insane. I mean, I think clinically <laughs> insane. Uh, there, there were times when he had a weapon in his hand and it was aimed at me, and I thought every moment that he had that weapon that I was going to die, whether it was in Tristan and Isolde or whether it was in Pagliacci. He would come, ah, say tu, Silvio, and this knife would go back, and I thought, bye bye, mom and dad. <laughs> somehow or other, he had just sufficient control to turn it at the last moment and save my life. Otherwise, I was curtains. <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I would die for my art, uh, but not in Pagliacci. <laughs> <laughs> no, I draw the line at that. Uh, but there was, as I say, this occasion, this is the, the nature of, uh, of the beast, and it really was a beast at times, um, built ideally for professional ice hockey. That's what he looked like, and that's what so many of his compatriots from Canada were, the ice hockey players. <laughs> immensely powerful, immensely powerful man with a very wide neck and a big, big smile, a big mouth. Ah! So when he opened it, he was, there was a cavern there. And when he sang, there's a brilliant, still brilliant recording of Fidelio, conducted by um, Klemperer, with Christa Ludwig as, as, as uh, Fidelio, that's still the best. And Vickers singing Floristan, if you haven't heard it, go and buy it now. 
uh, when he sings Gott Welchdunkel here, you really believe it. Uh, it tears you apart, the animal quality of this voice. And I experienced that on more than one occasion. One disastrous occasion was when he was singing uh, a performance of Tristan and Isolde coming out. I had a small role. I always think it was I was impersonating Veronica Lake. <laughs> there was a split in my skirt, and I had a long blonde wig. No wonder he wanted to kill me. He didn't, he didn't like men like that at all. Uh, but uh, I was melod, and I was up for the chop, and he was going to give it to me. He set about singing Tristan on one occasion. Uh, the first act was extraordinary and unusual for a singer. Uh, and for some of my colleagues too, we left our, the comfort of our, relative comfort of our dressing rooms to go down to the corner of to the wings to the side of the stage because we knew something very unusual was happening, the like of which I've never heard before and have never heard since. Uh, Vickers had decided to take Wagner on in a contest that night. Uh, he got through the first act and we stood in the wings listening to this man pouring out sound, pouring out sound, immense sound. You have no idea how much sound was being produced. The second act, of course, Tristan is immensely long. Second act, the same thing again. This immense sound was pouring out of him. He was giving absolutely everything. He had one act to go. At the end of the second act, I saw him call the famous Stella, stage manager, to him and had a quiet conversation in the middle of the stage and he walked off. And an announcement was then made at the beginning of the third act that he could no longer continue. And there were boos and hisses from the audience who wanted money back. And we had to cut the third act of Tristan unheard of to the point where Tristan is dead. But that man that night spilled his whole soul on that stage and gave something that was suicidal, but it was an extraordinary thing to witness. And he did it again more successfully sometime after that, when we were at the Albert Hall, which is of course the venue of the, the proms, the annual proms, and we were giving a performance of Peter Grimes, for which he was famous. And uh, very typical of John Vickers, he said, uh, I'm not coming to a morning rehearsal. I got to uh, sing Peter Grimes in the evening. I'm not rehearsing. So, okay, Mr. Vickers, that's fine. Uh, he said. And uh, they put on a, an understudy who would sing in with the orchestra that morning, what Mr. Vickers would say. I'm not wearing bow ties and things. I ain't doing it. I'm just going to wear gray slacks and a blazer and a tie. That's it. you got to accept it. Okay, Mr. Vickers, that's fine. Uh, you, you can do that. I'm not going to come on the stage and just sit there. I'm going to come and go, come and go as I please, as is required of the role. Okay, Mr. Vickers, you can do that as well. But you will turn up to this evening, will you? Uh, yes, I'll be doing that. So he turned up. He did turn up uh, for this rather extraordinary performance. He'd spent the day, I think, patrolling back and forth in um, Kensington Gardens or Hyde Park, uh, getting more and more nervous. And he came like a caged tiger or lion to the performance that night and again it was extraordinary because he'd saved up he decided he wanted to make a big statement about this piece and there's a part there's a, a, a moment in, in this great opera of Benjamin Britten's Peter Grimes where this outcast man this lonely figure this troubled figure of Peter Grimes screams to the heavens and says come on land me land me that's the text. Uh, and we got to that point in the opera, and I, I was convinced he was going to break windows. The Albert Hall is immense, and it has a, an extraordinary roof on it. And the noise that he made that night, singing this, is inhuman, I promise you. It's hard to believe that a human being, without amplification, can make that kind of noise, can make that sound. And it's rather, it was rather like the sound, I think, that Laurence Olivier described. The, he, he was famous in 
or was it in King Lear or Othello or whatever, for the scream that he had, this scream of agony. And they said, how did you do that? And he said, every time I came to it, I imagined I was an animal and I put my paw into a trap and it closed on my leg. And he screamed the resultant scream that you would make at that moment. And Vickers did that that night. And uh, it was sensational, absolutely sensational and crazy and wonderful and all of those things.